Hi, welcome to the fifth class on perceptual optics. This class is going to be on schemas. I would define a single schema as a grouping of brain information that shares a common realm, uh, whether that's 2D or 3D information. In other words, all the information pertaining to the physical world, or all the information pertaining to your imagination realm. Those would be two examples of schemas. We're going to cover a lot in this class, a whole lot. So let's dive in. The first schema is the real world schema. It's the one you're most familiar with. Uh, I would say it starts out as 2D information, retinotopic in visual cortex one and uh, processing can add depth information to it. Whereas the real world schema begins with 2D retinotopic color and pixel information and adds explicit 3D depth uh, as desired, the imagination schema seems to work in reverse starting with oftentimes memory 2D shapes that can be rotated to give a 3D uh, kind of translucent skin video that's low opacity. And then if you add enough attention and get lost in imagination or deep in a dream, then you may actually add coloration. So it's kind of like it's built in reverse. The bake schema is the storage of explicit 2D and 3D isometric shape forms. Last of all is the fusing schema. It's the schema which nests all the others inside. In other words, the real world and imagination and bank schemas are laid over each other in the same shared 3D space. And it's like an ultimate reference system. Uh, in the diagram, CMW stands for Cartoon Motor World, which was a term I used for the imagination schema. And SPW stands for Sensory Physical World, a term I use to denote the real world schema. Uh, AGU is anti-gravity up, it's a useful orientation vector. So in other words, it's denoting which way is up in any given schema. And as you can see in the image, the imagination schema of a band playing a song while the person is listening to music, it can rotate around relative to the real world schema. Uh, and then the alignment rings that you also see there are taken off of the bank, which is depicted here invisible, not shown. Uh, those would also be overlaid, all three together within a fusing schema. The flowing time window is proposed to be a operation performed inside the fusing schema, uh, in particular having to do with the alignment rings coming off of the bank and so it's just kind of another way of looking at working memory because we don't just keep track of the current millisecond. We generally are, are looking at a full tenth of a second or a full second worth of time in order to give us an understanding of our conscious experience. Uh, sometimes it may be that you are even considering more like five seconds or even longer durations. And so this is like a time window that you have degrees of, of um, earliness and lateness relative to the current moment. So the current moment would be the, the most central uh, alignment point, and there would be a tracer at any given millisecond moving along. And as time goes on, there's this flow going in, in an axial direction normal to the alignment ring or alignment tracer. And in real time, it's getting updated so that it's constantly flowing and future is moving into the present and then to the past, which makes it feel like you are moving into the future. And so it kind of gives you this understanding of time and, and helps you to have a, a, a working memory. This is depicting the flowing time window operation in the overarching fusing schema, which is this same shared perceptual space with the, the real world schema and stuff. So if you imagine these rings that are in this coronal plane uh, being two meters wide, uh, and this is like the, the present moment of conscious experience here, which is here depicted to lag actual reality by 0.5 seconds. 
then you can look ahead to the quote future, which is in this case the same as the actual present, and you can also look towards the past. So you have this uh, this window of working memory, um, and because it seems like things are flowing in that direction, therefore it seems like to you that you are moving constantly into the future. Now these rings can be higher frequency, lower frequency, uh, and they can bunch up axially. I'm not an expert on the hippocampus, but I think the basic idea is that as an animal is moving, there are neurons that fire at increasingly early stages to represent the animal's movement. Um, and that's called precession, where individual neurons fire slightly earlier than the rest of the group of neurons. Um, and it may in increasingly get earlier and earlier. So basically you, you trade time to represent space or spatial distance or spatial movement, things like that. So it's this kind of hippocampal gimmick. If we consider the alignment frames or slices of consciousness as being like planar slices, then they need to have a certain way to offset the new from the old, like we talked about in the last class. So this is just a review of those three mechanisms. You can move your attention from one item to another within the real world schema. You can move your body down a trail like when you're going for a hike. Um, and you can also just be stationary and the alignment rings can be stationary, but the old ones can get kicked out as you're printing new ones. And so that would, that would create the offset. This is just a recap of those three mechanisms again. You've got walking attention from phone to torso back to phone. Uh, you have self-motion down a trail, and you have kick-out of the older frames being artificially moved at some velocity in some direction. This is a depiction of the flowing time window. Uh, <clears throat> so you've got the real-world schema depicted by the driver. You have the imagination schema depicted by this mental imagery of Cobain playing uh, as, the, as the driver's listening to music. And you also have these rings, which are selected off the bank schema. So the bank is invisible here, as it usually is in common experience. And the rings would normally be invisible too. They're just used for alignment purposes. Um, but basically the idea is that this central most ring would constantly, there'd be a tracer tracing it out. And this, the, the, um, the canvas upon which it's printing is constantly moving to the left or, or to the right. But let's say it's moving to the left, so it kicks out these old rings and brings in the, the future or the look ahead region. And it's continually doing it, so it's like a flowing time window. As a recap from a previous class, your left and right eye are brought together to the center, like kind of where your nose is, but a little bit higher. And the, the rays of light from each eye fused together to being the same common rays. Now the features they see will be different, so if you hold your finger close to your nose and look in the distance, you will see two ghost images, um, but the, the ray orientations will be lined up between the two eyes. So you have this cyclopean uh, perceptual eye, um, because like, for example, if you hold your finger in front of your nose, you can see straight through the finger, uh, basically showing that it looks like your gaze point comes from right above your nose. Um, so it's a shared vantage point, which is called the, the avatar's perceptual cyclopean eye, to, to be specific. Uh, but there's also this concept of the mind's eye, which is constantly orbiting around and doing its own thing. Um, and so basically the, the idea is that you can switch between two briefly, or they can be, you know, they're going simultaneously, but the focus is a lot of times just going to be on one or the other. Um, and then if you're like looking forwards and someone to your right starts speaking and you don't turn your head towards them, your attention or your attentional eye will still look in that direction. Even though you can't physically see them, your attention is gazing in that direction, which is pretty interesting. So that would be, I think, an example of the perceptual cyclopean eye looking out to the side and not being able to physically see, but still imagining. Um, so in this diagram, uh, G 
D stands for gaze direction. Um, HCU stands for head crown up, so which way is your is the top of your head, uh, like a line coming out through the top of your head, which, which way is that, and then which way is right and left. So in a very real sense, the viewpoint has needs to have orientational specificity in, in three directions, or three dimensions, I should say. Uh, obviously, the gaze direction seems the most important, but also the gazes up is important, and the gazes left and right. So this just shows you um, some, some different examples. We saw this chart in the last class, but I've added a little bit to um, the organization. So basically the blue is showing you the paint schemas or the content of consciousness, and the yellow is showing you the bank schema or the context of consciousness. And all of it together is nested within this fusing schema. This shows you a hierarchy of schemas. So information coming from the left eye and right eye are fused together to make the stereoscopic cyclopean eye schema. Uh, which you could kind of think of as, as 2D, you could think of it as 3D, but it's kind of helpful to think of it for a moment as 2D, as a collection of um, rays going out of the one cyclopean perceptual eye, um, and each of those ray orientations being a specific pixel and being colored. And then that information is used to come up with the isometric environment like the ground that always stays a particular size and location no matter how you rotate your head and eyes. So you've got that, you've got your proprioception information. Uh, all this information together has to do with the, the real world realm or schema. Uh, you also have the imagination, so the imagined environment, but you're looking at it from some vantage point, which is the mind's eye, and together that makes up imagination schema. The bank seems to print out this imagination schema, and then it can become colored in dreams. Uh, the opposite seems to be true for the other side. That color and 2D information seems to be the, the starting point, and then you can add explicit 3D shape with the uh, bank as desired, as you bring your attention to a particular object or to the entire scene. I forgot to mention in the last slide that everything is encased inside the fusing schema. But this is showing you top down versus bottom up, which scientists talk about a lot. So in terms of my model, the very top would be the bank, uh, which stores isometric understanding of 2D and 3D shapes. And then you can work downwards from that. Um, you know, basically your, your expectations and predictions working downwards, or you can start with the external, external stimuli from the world that you're receiving from your eyes and your ears and proprioception and work your way upwards. So this is just showing you the hierarchy in those terms. So you have a lot of boxes here, but don't let it confuse you. It's simpler than it looks. You've just got the real world schema, the grass, the tree, uh, which makes up the environment. And you also have the, the body schema Body schema plus environment schema making the real world schema. Uh, body schema here is depicted as this brown orange box uh, and the green for the environment and also the real world schema. Uh, you've got these two smaller boxes here dedicated to the imagination schema and also the bank schema. And all of it together kind of needs to be nested in this final fusing schema. Uh, you know, as, as a final reference. But let's bring in one more concept, and that's the cyclopean eye schema. And you can think of this as a bunch of rays coming out of the center eye, and each ray is its own pixel. And the girl can, can turn her head, can turn her gaze direction, and the whole thing will pan in some direction. It's kind of like this TV dish or something. And, but as it does, the ground seems to remain stable because it's part of its own environment schema, and so this can rotate uh, with respect to this and, and still not get confused because you've got the, the two realms segregated. In the model of consciousness that I'm proposing, 
imagination schema is not just daydreaming. That is one example, but the imagination schema is fully half of your conscious experience. Uh, so basically it's providing the what and the feeling of experience. Uh, so its importance is highlighted by you know everyday activities like experiencing qualia, like you dip your foot in cold water. That feeling of cold is printed, I argue, with this imagination schema and with the flowing time window and the alignment rings. Um, qualia, understanding language. So as soon as someone starts talking, you start getting this mental imagery to give you the meaning, um, recalling episodic memory. All this stuff that you don't really think about is using the imagination schema. So it's a critical half of consciousness in this model and works in tandem with the real world scheme to provide a comprehensive understanding of the world. Some possible correlates of the schemas, although largely they're distributed. Uh, I would say the one I feel most confident about would be this bank schema. Seems to be lateral occipital cortex, fusiform gyrus, inferior temporal lobe. Uh, possibly also prefrontal cortex though, and some other areas. All right, it's a nice colorful slide, but it's gonna get even better in a couple slides here. Um, showing you the uh, postulated locations of schemas. The real world schema is probably right here, posterior parietal cortex. Body schema would definitely be originating first in the somatosensory cortex. Um, your imagination schema probably has a lot to do with the prefrontal cortex and also some of the visual uh, ventral stream. Um, bank schema, like I said, right in here. I feel pretty confident about that. Um, and then fusing schema, don't know for sure, but possibly the thalamocortical resonant circuit because you have the thalamus communicating with the entire cortex in that circuit and it can transiently shift attention from various components of various brain regions. All right, let's go ahead and add movement. So that would be uh, at least temporal alignment to motor commands and connected to this fusing schema, the alignment rings, the alignment tracer. Uh, but as you see here, we've connected this one disparate region, the, the, the where path with this other region, the what path and this imagination up here. So these were two segregated circuits. Now we are bringing them together in the fusing schema. Uh, like I said, there's a few spots where this stuff comes together. One is the hippocampus. Uh, one is the posterior parietal cortex and also the thalamocortical resonance circuit. You also see we have this flowing time window operation that is a part of the fusing schema. Okay, this is right at the heart of my model that at any given millisecond, the entire conscious cortex and its alignment to the timing of motor is at one voxel location within your perceptual space. And it's, it's used as this clapperboard or binding mechanism. And so in, a, in you know, over 100 milliseconds, you move it several spots so that you trace out a full ring um, and when consciousness is smooth, it's going to be a helix. We'll look at that later. Uh, so when consciousness is smooth, you're definitely not going to notice this. Uh, if you have some kind of NMDA antagonist like alcohol or, you know, just name your specific NMDA antagonist, then you're going to get more of noticing these, these cycles or frames. And you may, may even be able to notice an alignment tracer at just extremely fine temporal resolution. You know, like I said, it, it would be moving, you know, millisecond by millisecond, super fast. Uh, but as you see, it sits right at the heart of everything, whether imagination, whether real world, whether memory and, and shape storage, whether control of movement, you know, it's all comes linked right here. And so it needs to be some central part of the brain and that's why I'm saying I think it would, would likely be the, the thalamocortical resonant circuit. Uh, I've also looked at the hippocampus as being a possibility, and it may be the hippocampus provides the invisible 3D canvas 
that's flowing uh, for working memory. Um, but yeah, just, just fascinating to me that this could be the, the binding of all the brain activities for, for the cortex. Because this alignment ring can 3D rotate in real time, it's useful to come up with coordinates in terms of the alignment ring. And so that's what we're doing here. We have this ring. It's got a certain phase amount from, you know, so you start at zero degrees, you get up to 90 degrees, 180, 270. So here it might be like 320 degrees. But you can specify exactly where in the phase you're at. You can specify the radius, which changes in real time. You can specify thread uh, thread offset. You can uh, specify this this ring attitude or this vector that's normal to the plane of the ring at any given moment. Uh, so, you know, interesting coordinate system. In normal consciousness, things are smooth, and I propose that there is this helix going on. And so basically it's like this alignment tracer is moving in a circular path like that, but because the canvas is flowing and moving the, the past frames outward, therefore uh, you create this kind of helix structure as you're tracing a ring. Um, like I said, it's usually smooth like that, but with an NMDA antagonist such as ketamine or alcohol, I propose you're going to bunch up these action potentials into groupings and so you have a ring draw duration of the frame and then you get a gap and then a ring draw duration and a gap so you get this very jerky kind of experience of consciousness and so they've actually done a test with rodents where they administer ketamine and in fact they do find that a smooth train of action potentials gets bunched up just like this uh, they found 2 to 4 hertz in the retrosplenial cortex, and we'll look at that in a second. Uh, but this would be a very good correlate for why alcohol or any kind of NMDA antagonist may make consciousness feel more jerky or even more planar. Because as you see, if, if you trace a ring very quickly and the invisible 3D canvas that's flowing doesn't have as much time to flow, you're creating more of a planar slice through the, the, the whatever schema, real world schema, whatever. And so it's going to look like you've got these, these planes walking around, these planar frames, um, and it's going to feel discontinuous and, and jerky. Uh, this is showing like one cycle of consciousness here. Uh, but yeah, let's go to the next slide. This is showing you the same concept in 3D, so now you can see the helix a little better and how it would get broken up into individual planar slice, slices or, or closer to a plane um, and bunched up. Uh, the other thing I was going to mention is that each of these spikes could represent not just a single action potential but a whole ensemble of neurons dedicated to represent some point in perceptual space. And so this would be one ensemble, this would be a different one, this would be a different one. Uh, but then once you got back to here to a new cycle of consciousness because this next cycle is very similar to the other one, it may use the same or very similar ensemble sequence to basically depict the same uh, cycling of the alignment tracer. Um, and this wouldn't necessarily be all brain activity, it would just be whatever brain activity is dedicated to uh, alignment and, and to this tracer. Um, so yeah, that's kind of explanation of that. Uh, this article here is very good, by the way deep posteromedial cortical rhythm and dissociation. This is the article where they looked at ketamine uh, with mice or with some kind of rodent. This is an area that I'm not quite sure how to explain, uh, but it might be that consciousness carries um, certain felt qualia by the use of time, um, either, either the earliness or lateness of a signal that it includes into consciousness um, could be code for the, the amount of axial offset from the current tense ring, or it could use continued vibration until the uh, particular stimulus is carried to the right amount of axial offset and then stop, and, and when it stops is depicting, hey, it's supposed to go right here. So what qualia would we be talking about? Well, we'd be talking about, um, like if you hear someone in the distance cough, 
it may vibrate as soon as they cough and continue vibrating until the flow carries it to wherever it would intersect that person. Um, so you could use um, either earliness or lateness or continued vibration or something to that effect, uh, not only sound but also uh, inertial touch, like uh, you know, you, you feel something on your arm but the, the current ring is not right there, the alignment ring, so it would have to continue vibrating that sense of touch for just slightly longer until the, the flow carried it to that location and then, and then stopped. Um, like I said, that's extremely speculative, but I just want to throw that out there as um, kind of this, this possibility for using time to encode spatial distance. Um, this will be taking it even one more step further, which is like, okay, what if it uses time alone? So the, the neural action potentials, it doesn't matter, you know, their location doesn't matter. All that matters is the temporal code, and you would have to um, basically use like 100 milliseconds would be dedicated to representing the phase around the ring, and then you'd use cyclic precession, um, earliness or lateness, to basically, quote, carry this this paint to the right location. Um, like I said, very speculative, just throwing it out there. I've probably referenced this paper more than any other, uh, but it's tremendously good. And it shows basically that uh, rodents, their, their normal experience of consciousness, they get these pretty, uh, you know, smooth action potentials as a train of action potentials in the retrosplenial cortex, somatosensory cortex. Uh, under normal experience, it's pretty smooth, and then after ketamine, it, they bunch up into these bunchings at about two hertz. And not only do they bunch up, but retrosplenial gets anti-correlated with somatosensory. So when when it is silent, somatosensory is the loudest, and when somatosensory is quiet, retrosplenial is the loudest. And it's not perfect, but it's just showing you that they're getting out of sync. And so what this paper postulates is that the rat is experiencing dissociation, uh, you know, where, you know, he still can see his body, but it's like he doesn't have full control over it. It's like the body is doing its own thing, you know, irrespective of his will or his consciousness or his conscious control. Um, so showing two different things, cyclization, bunching up, and also this anti-correlation or, or dissociation at, you know, moderate amounts of, of ketamine, uh, which, like I said, is an NMDA antagonist. A uh, high dose, dose of that, I think, is actually uh, anesthetic. It would knock uh, consciousness completely out. A lot of times, scientists start with matter and try to work their way up in understanding consciousness, uh, but we've got this kind of black box of mechanism that seems to be, you know, tricking everybody up. So my idea is, what if you start with consciousness and try to pay as much attention to it as you can and study it as well as you can and try to look for these underliers of consciousness. Like, look at consciousness at a very fine temporal resolution uh, and, and try to tease out as much little bits of detail as you can and, and work the problem from this opposite direction um, where, where hopefully you know, we can finally find out what the black box is. The traditional view of the homunculus, homunculus and the uh, motor cortex, first proposed by Penfield, has been overturned. Uh, this is the new integrate isolate model, 2022, and you still have this foot region, this hand region, and this mouth tongue region, um, like you did with the old one. But you have these uh, these inter effector regions. That's like the whole body. And these inter-effector regions are communicating a lot more with, with other regions of the brain so that you have more of this um, kind of proprioception or perceptual space control or command over your, your motor cortex and your, your, uh, your, your actions. Um, and so basically the idea is that the most distal parts, like your fingers, would be right at the center, or the toes would be right at the center, the tongue, so that the, the finest control uh, is for the, the most distal parts, and then you, you go more proximal 
from there with these surrounding rings around it um, until you get to the, the whole body. Um, so that's pretty interesting. Uh, like I said, the, the idea of the hand plays largely in my model of the bank structure, which I say is offset to the right and tilted slightly. So the basic idea is that you have effector-specific regions of the motor cortex, and you have these uh, inter-effector regions. So a pretty interesting new model that they've got. And this, like I said, this is a motor cortex. It's not somatosensory, but it's the, it's the motor control cortex. I think it's possible that your 2D information may be processed by the dorsal visual stream largely uh, at 40 to 80 hertz, while 3D shape information may be processed at a more variable rate, such as 2 to 80 hertz or even more, um, especially for like representing sound, um, and that would be the ventral visual stream. So basically two components. A diorama is a very good way to conceptualize what I'm talking about. So you've got this back cylindrical 2D understanding of colors, pixels, but as you bring your ventral visual stream uh, attention to something like the foreground, you can create this isometric model understanding of that portion of your visual field. Uh, so you get, you create the, you convert the pixels to voxels for the region that you brought your attention to transiently. Um, so very good little conceptualization of, of how that could work. This is a video of a diorama at Legacy Museum in Tuskegee, Alabama. I'm going to give you an idea again of the, the 2D background and the 3D isometric foreground that you bring your attention to. Here we are looking at someone from the backside and seeing through their head to the cyclopean eye and the rays coming out in every direction. And so the rays would be like the, the dorsal wear path, the 2D, so to speak. And I call it 2D because it's basically pixel information. It doesn't tell you the depth of each ray. Um, whereas the ventral what stream, shall I say bank schema, as you bring your attention to some part of the scene, you can actually uh, convert the, the pixels to voxels and have explicit 3D understanding of the uh, isometric shape of the object. This is a slice or a patch of the visual cortex and the dark bands are representing um, like your, your left eye and the bright is like your right eye. So these are ocular dominance columns, left, right, left, right, like that. And then the rainbow is showing you that there's these pinwheels and there's a certain pinpoint around which you have varying response uh, to, the, to a line orientation. So blue might be vertical, this might be tilted 45 degrees, this might be sideways, and so on. So for, for any given um, pixel that you're looking at, you could have a, a line orientation that you're having edge detection for you know, going in any of these directions. And then it also can look for movement of that line. Um, like let's say the blue is a vertical line. Part of this could be looking for when the blue line is moving to the right. And part of it could be looking for when the blue line is moving to the left. So you get you know, orientational specificity and, and the beginning of looking for movement. Um, the white circles are cytochrome oxidase blobs uh, function is currently unknown on those uh, but you know pretty fascinating here um, Leonard White with Duke University has an entire course dedicated to the brain and I watched it and it was very fascinating so if you're into that check it out uh, and he's got another slide here I'll show in the next one so again this is Leonard White in his study um, and it's just showing that as you get older, you know, from birth upwards to adult, you're growing these connections out from, uh, basically this is layer two, three of the visual cortex. And, you know, if you have one uh, line orientation of a um, pinwheel 
for a particular pixel, then it's going to want to connect up with pixels, other pixels that are responsive to that same particular orientation. Like maybe all of these are looking for a vertical line. So it gets together with all the buddies that are like neighbors. Um, if I understand that correct, I think that's basically what he was saying on that. But you can definitely see these, these horizontal connections uh, between pinwheels. Um, it's pretty fascinating. I think that the brain has to have some kind of way to map to a universal perceptual space. Uh, it, it may even be that that's kind of the shared language of the cortex, the binding language, um, is this conscious experience in, in 3D space that we seem to have. Uh, so where would that be? Uh, one idea is that every single column in the cortex, of which I think there's 100,000, each one of those columns could have 50 neurons dedicated to mapping each, each of a trillion or more voxels within perceptual space, and then you link the neighboring uh, columns, just like in the previous slide or, or something similar, so that the, the particular ensemble of those 50 that are dedicated to representing a particular point in perceptual space would, would link up with the particular ensemble of neighboring columns that represent that same identical one spot within perceptual space and then do that times a trillion or times a million or whatever like all these different uh, locations within perceptual space integrate with the rest of the brain so that you have a shared common mapping to perceptual space um, that would be you know fairly resource intensive because over a hundred thousand columns that would mean what five million neurons but you know it's not that bad but it's kind of resource intensive uh, we've got another idea on the next slide Actually, this slide is still talking about the cortical columns as being the, a possible location for a shared perceptual space. Um, so if you, if you took 50 neurons from each, uh, that basically would be like a 50-bit binary, uh, which could store one quadrillion possible uh, encodings, which could be mappings to specific voxel locations. Uh, and then you would link things together. So that's, that's an idea, but let's move on to the next slide where we're gonna discuss another option. So what if instead of 100,000 different copies of this mapping to perceptual space, what if you just use the thalamus, use the nonspecific cells therein, and let their connections with the cortex uh, somehow encode the universal shared perceptual space? Then you only have to have this one instantiation and you don't have to do it 100,000 times. Okay, so anti-correlation uh, is basically the idea that sometimes these schemas are not overlaid. Sometimes you get 100% of one for 100 milliseconds, and then you get 100% of another one for 100 milliseconds, and then you go back to the other one again. And so it's this you know, very subconscious shift happens very quickly and somehow the brain is able to do it where you don't really even notice it. But uh, I, I would say that this is definitely um, possible for, for something that the brain can do sometimes. Now, sometimes it does overlay all, all the schemas over each other so that they're simultaneous. In that, in that case, they would be correlated. But we can look at brain activity where you have just the posterior parietal cortex and, and the, the back half of the brain lit up, and then it shuts down, and just the front prefrontal cortex area is lighting up, and then it goes back to the other one, um, which looks to me, and this is like literally happening over 0.1 second, 0.1 second, 0.1 second, that fast of a jump. Uh, so to me, that looks like, you know, real world schema, imagination schema, real world schema. You notice two here, this is your eyeball, your perceptual cyclopean eye looking at the real world. For this split moment that you get imagination, you hotkey down to the mind's eye and wherever location it happens to be. And so you're looking at it from some other vantage and you're looking at something completely different, the imagination, the, 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 whatever's providing meaning of your, of your thoughts. Um, so yeah, kind of like this alignment rings or frames would, would be this kind of portal to, to hotkey uh, between. So like the rings could be like in front of this a little bit somewhere 
and the rings would stay the same orientation that viewed from here, they'd be painting the imagination schema, uh, something like that. First, this video is showing you in slow motion this transition, and then it's going to show in real time. So the real time is like one second of action, and you get 0.3 seconds devoted to each schema. EEG recordings are harmless and they are non-invasive and Simons Institute and or Terry Sojnowski was able to obtain 10 hertz traveling and standing wave EEG data from a baby. And so for babies they have a thinner skull and EEGs can provide more accurate readings of their brain activity. So this is showing uh, in somewhat slow motion these 10 hertz traveling and standing waves. And you can see sometimes they're more traveling like there and then sometimes they just like flash between one and the other they jump like um, let's see like yeah like right there just kind of jumping back and forth um, so the, the jumping activity would would, would show an anti-correlation and, and possibly this uh, this the not sort of sequential switching between real-world schema and imagination schema and back. Let's take this concept one step further. So what if it's possible that not only frames of imagination can be integrated subliminally into conscious experience, what if memory frames can also be integrated? So the idea is like you're lying on a bed at nighttime and your attention is brought to your torso and the torso triggers a memory of another time when your attention was on your torso such as when you were driving but because these two need to align in the same uh, rotation and, and uh, location that memory has the road going upwards at this weird angle relative to you lying on the bed uh, and your, your, your legs would be like that as opposed to straight out on the bed. Um, but if your attention is just on the torso and the torso triggered this memory, this is, would be the orientation that it would be at. So we will now look at uh, a video of this. So let's go to the next slide. As a warning, this is a strobe effect. So if that bothers you, uh, don't watch it. But uh, pretty interesting here. We'll start first in the video with uh, this this memory frame being thrown in in, in like reduced speed, 25%, and then it'll repeat and go at 50% speed, and then finally it will go in real time at 100% speed, which would be like 10 hertz frames of consciousness, so only 0.1 second would be devoted to sh showing the triggering of the memory frame, which is probably more realistic to real life, but it's also harder to notice. So kind of pay attention in the, in the slower speed so that you'll be able to see it at the higher speed. Okay, here we go. So we've got these frames. Oh, there was the car. Now we're going to speed it up. Car, real time. We'll do it again. So as you can see, it's pretty subliminal, and of course the car wouldn't be colored in the memory frame, uh, but it would give you the, the feeling of what your mood was when you were driving at this particular memory frame, uh, and you know basically whatever your consciousness recorded to memory from that, it would get a gist of that, uh, and then you could choose to ruminate on that memory, but it would just be this little frame that was just thrown in. And you can see how the torso in both cases lines up perfectly. And this is an interesting place to uh, finish up here because the next class we'll be talking about memory.